Thank you, Dean Fisher. It is such an honor to be here with all of you today. I'm going to begin by confessing something to you. I've never given a commencement speech before. That made me a little nervous when I was invited to come here and address all of you. But then I remembered that you have never graduated from law school before. So this is a big first for you, the graduates here today, and perhaps for some of your families. And you have already done all the hard work it took to get here. So I hope I can keep up my end of the bargain. I have something else in common with you, the state of Connecticut. I have lived here in the city of New Haven on and off, and really mostly on, since 1989. I sometimes joke with my husband that I'm not sure New Haven and Connecticut are meant to be my final destination in life, but the truth is that I am not going anywhere. And if your class of UConn Law graduates is like the classes that have come before you, many of you will join me in staying here in the state. If you combine the numbers from last year and the year before, about 70% of UConn Law graduates chose to stay and work in Connecticut after graduation, and more than 80% of you um, stayed in New England. To me, this is especially welcome news right now, in a moment of turmoil and uncertainty for our national government in Washington, D.C. When I feel most concerned about what is happening in Washington, I think, well, we need to make Connecticut as good a place to live as we possibly can. Traditionally, conservatives have been attuned to the value of federalism and the importance of state and local government. Liberals, too, are starting to learn this lesson and seize the chances that come with it. Legal scholars like Heather Gerken, Christina Rodriguez, and Abby Gluck have called for a kind of liberal federalism that draws on the idea that the states are laboratories of democracy. If the national government sets the floor by protecting civil rights and providing for a decent standard of living and access to social services, we hope, states can do more. They can create a, create a kind of ceiling for their residents. We can try things here in the state of Connecticut on a relatively small scale that may prove to have real value elsewhere in the country. Think of marriage equality, or the first attempts at universal health care, or equalizing school funding across communities, reducing carbon emissions, or if you're inclined, the legalization of marijuana. Whether you are liberal or conservative, somewhere in between, the opportunity exists to make your state more generous and more hospitable to its citizens. Service in state and local government is one of the proudest traditions of this law school, the school that you have had the privilege to attend. The graduates who have preceded you are among the leaders at all levels of state government. They occupy the ranks of the judiciary, the legislature, and state and city agencies. Some of you are planning your next jobs in public service in this state or elsewhere, and I think you'll find working for state and local government to be particularly rewarding because of its relatively manageable nature in size and in scale. You can make your influence felt. You can work for and with your neighbors. I hope as you do whatever you plan to do next, you will think about how to make our society more equal. This is a continuing challenge for us in the state and throughout the country. It is, I believe, the most pressing challenge of our time. In Connecticut, to generalize for a minute, we have some relatively well-off suburbs and towns. We have some medium-sized cities, which tend to be poorer, and some rural areas, which tend to be poorer as well. To a degree, our divisions of race and class track these lines between urban, suburban, and rural. As lawyers, you can cross these divides. Whatever your career may take you to, whether it's a private law firm, a business, academia, the nonprofit sector, government work, being a lawyer comes with opportunities and indeed obligations for service. Think about how we could have more affordable housing in our state and how you could help make that happen. We owe lawyers and courts for the progress we've made in integrating our schools by race and class. But there is more work to be done. As you know, you have clinics here at UConn that are deeply engaged in this work. Some of you have already helped to represent abused and neglected children, or helped low-income people file their tax returns, assisted nonprofit organizations, worked in criminal defense, and in state attorney's offices. 
You also have a clinic that helps immigrants win asylum and that was honored with an award this spring for its work at the York County Prison in Pennsylvania. I can't think of anything more important in this moment when the federal government is far too eager to increase the number of deportations and is forcing some people to leave the country without adequate due process. You can stay involved with all of this work as UConn graduates, and you can find other ways to use your legal skills for social benefit. I am especially aware right now of the enormous task of making the criminal justice system a system that actually does justice. I'm working on a book about prosecutors, and in my reporting, I see things in criminal court every day that simply would not be tolerated in the civil system. For example, cash bail, which determines who goes to jail and who goes free based on how much money they have, and often forces families to go into debt to meet the demands of bail bondsmen. Or consider the rules for disclosing evidence. In most states, in criminal cases, there is nothing like the broad right to discovery that parties have in a civil suit. People plead guilty or they go to trial without knowing the strength of the state's case against them. Then there are the frequent delays and continuances which force people to come back to court again and again. Maybe that sounds like a small thing, but it makes defendants miss work if they have jobs, and it simply wears them down. Sometimes people plead guilty to crime so that their lives will no longer be in limbo. The problem is that then they are stuck with the consequences of a criminal record. Connecticut is not the worst place for criminal justice in America, but it is also not yet the best place. The state has not reduced mass incarceration as much as other states in our region, even though our crime rate is at a 48-year low. I look at the number of people we lock up, often for long periods of years that cannot be justified on grounds of deterring crime, and I see one very painful result of America's social inequality. In civil court, the people who fill the benches look middle class and they are mostly white, while in criminal court they are usually poor and they are often black or Latino. I don't think that's a coincidence. My grandfather, David Bazelon, was a federal appeals court judge in Washington, D.C. from the 1950s to the 1980s. In 1971, the year I was born, he gave his first commencement address at George Washington University Law School, and he got return engagements at a series of law schools afterwards. I read his speeches in preparing to give this one. My grandfather talked about all kinds of cases that came before him, but he was especially concerned with the criminal cases. In 1971, he said, and I quote, this is a little bit of a long quote, I don't pretend to know what justice is in every situation, nor can I make the fine distinctions that some people make between justice on the one hand and mercy on the other. But all of us should be able to recognize the stench of injustice, and that's a step in the right direction. It seems to me that one way to make sure students know injustice is to give them some first-hand experience with the misery and sufferings of real people. Certainly, my own sense of injustice is kept alive most vividly by the real cases of human misery that come before my court. Then my grandfather told a story about a girl named Betty Jean who was brought to juvenile court in Washington. She was a victim of abuse, of serious abuse, and her lawyer asked for a psychiatric examination before her sentencing. But the juvenile court judge dismissed Betty Jean's suffering. He said of her history of abuse, quote, such experiences are far from being uncommon among children in her socioeconomic situation, with the result that the traumatic effect might be expected to be far less than it would be in the case of a child raised by parents and relatives who give them better habits and customs. My grandfather did not agree with this judge. I think he felt strongly about how much he was in opposition because he came from a poor family himself. He told this story about Betty Jean to point out something obvious. Poor people are just as affected by tragedy and hardship as anyone else. He paraphrased an exchange between the writers F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway that goes like this in his paraphrasing. The very poor are different from you and me. Yes, they have less money. 
I say that this is obvious, but I fear that more than 40 years later, the assumptions about who deserves what that disturbed my grandfather in his courtroom are still implicit and sometimes even explicit in our criminal justice system. We continue every day to treat people as if their lives have less worth because they have less money or less education or come from families of less influence. The best way I know to change that is to cross the lines of class and race that divide us. We can do that as citizens and we can also do it as lawyers. Let me give you an example of progress along these lines in our state of Connecticut. Last June, the legislature approved a package of reforms introduced by Governor Dana Malloy called the Second Chance Society. The initiative aims to reduce the number of people going to prison and to make it easier for those who get out, because almost everybody gets out, to have a chance at a law-abiding life. Among other things, the reform plan reclassified simple drug possession from a felony to a misdemeanor and eliminated mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug possession. Earlier this month, the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, moved in the opposite direction. He instructed federal prosecutors around the country to charge and pursue the most serious, readily provable offense which means that more people will serve mandatory minimum sentences in federal prisons for nonviolent offenses. In response, 30 current and former state prosecutors signed an open letter saying that the new Sessions policy, quote, marks an unnecessary and unfortunate return to past tough on crime practices that will do more harm than good in their communities. These state prosecutors wrote that, quote, there is strong evidence that contact with the justice system exacerbates the likelihood that a low-level offender will go on to commit serious crimes. This is the harm the Connecticut's Second Chance Initiative is trying to suggest, to address. This is federalism at work. The prosecutors who wrote that open letter are truly independent of Jeff Sessions and of the federal government. They can do what they think is best for their local communities. And increasingly, it has become a matter of bipartisan agreement across more than 30 states that making the criminal justice system more effective means making it less punitive and treating the root causes of crime. What the states decide on this front matters a great deal because it is in state court, not federal court, that 90% of crimes are prosecuted. In November, our, government, our governor in Connecticut proposed that our state become the first state in the country to raise the age of adult criminal responsibility to 21 from 18 for all but the most serious crimes. Governor Malloy pointed out that most people between the ages of 18 and 20 who would be sent to the juvenile system under this plan are arrested on misdemeanor charges, not felonies. Writing about Connecticut as a potential model for other states, my colleagues on the editorial page at the New York Times asked if Connecticut's new initiatives will succeed. And they answered, quote, it's still too early to know the effect of many of the recent reforms, but earlier efforts are already paying off. For example, after lawmakers in Connecticut raised the age of adult criminal responsibility to 18 from 16, the number of people between 18 and 21 behind bars dropped by more than half. This is the kind of effort that I think recognizes the stench of injustice, as my grandfather put it, and does something rational and evidence-based about it. If what Connecticut wants to do works, it has the power to reduce the suffering of juvenile offenders and their families, and also to make the rest of us safer by preventing future crime. I am sure that it is lawyers who helped come up with this new policy, and I know that it could not have passed without the support of the defense bar, of prosecutors, and of judges. Whatever you do next, please don't forget about the criminal courts. You might volunteer to represent clients there or serve on a task force designed to improve this part of our system. You might think of using some of the tools of my profession, journalism, by going out to just see how the criminal justice system operates. Get to know people whose lives have been ensnared by crime, both the victims and the perpetrators. Often, I think you'll find they are not as different from each other as you might think, and they are also really not different from you and me standing here today. 
If you work with them, or better yet, get to know them as friends and neighbors, you will widen your own lens of perception. You will see things that you didn't see before, and maybe that will change the work you do as lawyers and how you shape the next generation of the legal profession. Thank you so much for listening, and congratulations to you and your teachers and your families.